We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and grab them and turn with me to John chapter 15 and hold your place there. We're going to jump back and forth to John 15 quite a bit today. Uh, but if you don't have a copy of the Word of God, there is a Bible in the seat in front of you uh, that you are welcome to take and write your name in it, and that is yours. We want you to have, have a copy of the Word of God. I also want to make you all aware real quick as we talk today, if you uh, see me grabbing this stack of tissues and this, or this towel, I just had surgery. Like, I had a nose job. Not really a nose job. I had sinus surgery uh, three days ago. <laughs> And so uh, you might see a little drippage, but like that. Uh, but we're going to be all right. So, uh, you know, we're right literally in the middle of a three-week series called Stay, Tomorrow Needs You. And this series is about mental health. Pastor Mac opened up the series last week with an incredible message. He's really passionate about this particular subject. And, and he, you know, it's been almost six years since he stood up here and delivered a message, and I think he did an incredible job bringing a, a powerful message that God has spoke to him. Can we give it up for him real quick? So Pastor Matt will be back next week, and he'll finish off the series for us. But today, we are going to dive in and talk about how we as believers should stay connected to God. And I can promise you that whether you are struggling with mental health issues, or if you feel like you are at the peak of your health, uh, staying connected to God is, is, is really vital. And so today's message topic, or today's title, I should say, is called Stay Connected. And let's read from John 15 from the New Living Translation. It says, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. Let's pray. Father, we just ask, Lord, that you would help us to be connected to you, the true vine, that you would help us to understand this process in life that you have put us, uh, that, that we are here living through. God, I pray, Lord, that we would understand how to, to how staying connected to you is, is important for our health, for our mental health. In, in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, church, almost 86 years ago, come July 2nd, so, so July 2nd, 1937, there is a, a lady named Amelia Earhart, who you probably learned from back in like, grade, learned about back in grade school, but she, uh, she, she got in a little plane and she attempted to fly around the world. Have you ever heard of her? Amelia Earhart, yes. So they, they say that she had the latest technology. She had a great co-pilot. She had it all mapped out. She had even the tiniest details planned. And, but something happened just before takeoff that would change the course of history and would dramatically change her story, the, the, the story that she should have been known for at least. You know, when I learned about her in history classes, I don't know if my teacher just didn't like talking about her or what, but the only thing that, she ta that they taught me was that she disappeared into obscurity. She, she got in a plane, she had a goal, and she didn't make it. That's all they talked about. But what we don't usually hear about unless you start to study her or you, you dive more into her story is that somehow the antenna that was used to, uh, for her to receive communication was broken off of her plane. 
For several hours, the ground communication teams tried to interact with her. They tried to talk to her, but her, with her with her aircraft or her co-pilot and stuff. But but they, they couldn't get a signal to go through to her. And when they did, it was completely impossible to understand. So the communication that did get through was consistently misunderstood. It was consistently garbled up and broken and disrupted. And, and there's interference. And so for hours, this continued. And finally, it became pretty clear: Amelia could not find her landing zone, her, her landing strip. She couldn't find where she was supposed to be. And, her, and it was because of her inability to connect the people that were there to help her. She tried to communicate with ground support for help, but there was radio silence. There was nothing. Now for 86 years, people look at her story as a reminder of how important a strong connection is. And I want to tell you today, yes, a strong connection is important, but who, who you are connected to is more important. Not only did Amelia need a connection with someone, it was more important that she was connected to the right people. You know, sometimes in life, a strong connection is the difference between life and death. Sometimes it's the difference between landing the plane and disappearing into obscurity. And sometimes in, in life, a connection is the critical element to everything else. You know, when you think about the human body, did you know that there are, we have over 100 trillion neurological connections in our body? happening at one time usually. So if you want to tell your fingers to move, you know, that's a neurological, connect, neurological connection. We never usually do this here, uh, but just for the heck of it and just to, just to have some fun, go ahead and turn to your neighbor next to you and tell, tell them some people have a little less. <laughs> I just do that because I needed a moment to wipe my nose, actually. <laughs> Well, these connections in your brain are critical for, for your body to function. It gives you a, safe, a sense of taste and touch and smell and sight. All of these things that are, uh, there are signals that, from your brain that move throughout your body so that you can respond. And I would say it's super, it's so incredibly important for all these connections to stay intact. You know, in our bodies, if, if our bodies that were created by God have so many working parts that need to stay connected... Why do we think it's okay to do life, to, to, to walk on this earth, to do anything on a daily basis without the most important connection, without the connection to God? Today, I want to talk to you about four enemies that seek to break our connection with God. And listen, these four things often lead us down this path of that, that down paths that destroy our mental health. You know, the Bible says, well, no, the Bible doesn't say it, but you learn from the Bible that if you study uh, like the, the, the enemies that we are up against, if the enemy can't destroy you, what will he do? He'll distract you. And so these four enemies do just that. And listen, these four, en- these four things I'm going to talk about, they lead us down these paths that destroy our mental health. And I personally struggle with anxiety. Sometimes it can be months before I have any kind of anxious thought. Sometimes it's weeks, and sometimes there's days and weeks at a time that it's like never ending. And I've witnessed these four enemies destroy my own ability to be healthy over and over again. And before we get to the first one, I want to take a moment to define something just real quick. I think it's important to remember what Jesus said in John 15. He basically says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. And the most important thing for you to even live is to remain in me because without me, you can do nothing. Now, I paraphrase that a bit, but in most translations, when we read this scripture, most translations use the word abide. And and, and a working definition for the word abide, for, for what it means to abide in Jesus is this, to remain in a place of dependent confidence of in Christ and open fellowship, relationship, and connection with his spirit. And let me just say, when you are not living by this definition, you are not as connected as you think. You are not, your ability to connect might be gargled, might be full of interference. And because by, by, th- by this definition alone, we would be daily pursuing him. We'd be daily worshiping him. We'd be daily communicating or praying to God. Every day we would be pushing the things of the world away while we're pursuing the will of God in our lives and renewing our minds in the word of God. Instead of, instead, what we have, what we have is this crazy world around us is, is trying to replace this feeling of abiding in him, trying to replace the need or the dependence of Christ with things of the world that we don't need. 
You know, what, 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 when you think about secular music and, and, and movies that are out and advertisements and magazines, almost everywhere you look, you can't get away from it. You, you see sex, drugs, nudity, alcohol, money. The, the world tries to get you hooked on these things that they say that lying's okay. They say adultery is okay. They say gossip is okay. They say slander is okay. Even, there's even laws that are supposed to govern us and help us in our lives, but they're trying to conf- get us to conform to unbiblical principles principles. In the world, they'll take even what is in the scripture and they'll take a, a, a word or a, an entire passage and they will completely twist the meaning and, and con, com, completely cut out the, the context and they twist it to get believers to conform to their standard. In other words, they want you to break your connection with, with, with Christ to, to not abide or to remain in Christ, but to abide in the world and follow along with the standards of the world. And one way that they get you to do this is to make you forget who you are in Christ. The first enemy that seeks to break your connection with Christ is forgetfulness. It says in John 15, verses 1, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. This passage in John 15 opens up by reminding you that He is the true vine. And I believe that there's this reminder in here to ensure you that ensure us that we don't forget that there will be people in our lives that try to get us to go a direction contrary to what God has planned for us. There will be things that come up in your mind and in your heart because of culture around you that the enemy will use to try and get you to do something or act a certain way that's different than the purpose that God has for you. Those people, those things, they are called false vines. A false vine is something or someone that that you thought was giving you life. You thought it was giving you the substance that you need to sustain or to produce real fruit in your life. But in reality, they are the things that are that you're drawing from on a daily basis, on a constant basis. But they don't. They're not producing anything good or anything of God. Without realizing it, we tend to put friends, we, we put jobs, uh, sex and money and alcohol and drugs. And I mean, the list goes on of things, how many things that in our lives that we worship, the things that we don't even realize we're worshiping, things that we, we put in a position of being the vine. And in return, we're not getting life. Slowly, what's happening is our identity is becoming something that we can no longer see. And because we can't see it, because we have forgotten who we are in Christ, we start to listen to the lies of the enemy and we start to tell ourselves those lies that the enemy wants us to think about ourselves. Our identity in Christ becomes so lost that we search where we shouldn't be searching. We forget who we are in Christ and we try to cling onto anything that makes us feel worthy, makes us feel good and loved and cared for. Sometimes, you know, we could quote it all. We could quote all the scriptures. We could say what the Bible says about us and about our identity out loud. But, but at, at that point, we realize we're not even connected to the vine. I'm not a betting man, but I would dare say, I would bet that every single person in this room has made an online purchase before. If you have not, I'd be impressed. Have you, who in here has not made an online purchase before? Oh, uh, okay, there's one, but I bet she's lying. I'm just playing with you. Maybe, I don't, you know. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of websites that do this nowadays, but when you click on an item and you add it to your cart, oftentimes what you see, you see a little pop-up or another page that comes up, right? And what does it do? It says, you just, you know, added this item to your cart. Now, look at these items. Look at these deals. It's trying to get you to add these other items. And if you're anything like me, you're like, ooh, that's cool. I really want that. That looks really nice. That's better than what I originally put. So you click it, and then you're like, oh, that's even better than the first thing that I put in the cart. So let me take out the first thing. But then you try to take out the first thing, and now the price goes up on the other item because it's a connected deal, right? You, you have to be connect. It has to be there. The first item has to be there for it to, for it to work. You know, I, I do that pretty often. But sometimes I think that we, we like to think of Jesus like an add-on item. We're like, you know, I love sports. I love my job. I love my girlfriend or my boyfriend, my wife or my husband. I love this and that. I love my kids. I love whatever it might be. And let me just add a little Jesus on that too. But what you need to understand is that you can't add Jesus onto an already full purchase list. You can't add Jesus onto an already full purchase list. Jesus has to be the true vine in your life. He, he must be the source and must be the substance of your life. And when he is, you'll find fruit. When he is, you'll find life. And when he's not, you won't. Verse 2 shows us, that, shows us what the second enemy is. 
Check it out. Jesus says in verse 2, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. Remember in verse 1, Jesus called his father the gardener, and I think it's so important that we remember that. So I don't want you to be fooled by this. Some of you might be sitting here thinking, you know, I've been going to church for the last two years. I haven't missed a Sunday, or I've been going for 20 years. And, and you know, maybe you, you know all the right boxes to check and, and, and the right way to respond when people ask you about your faith. And, you know, we believe here that we are justified. We are made, we are, we are made right with God by faith. But the faith that justifies is never alone. You know, the faith that justifies always bears fruit. It always produces Christ-like character in our lives. So I want you to, to think back in your lives about a year ago. Do you love less now than you did a year ago? Have you progressively grown in your patience or your peace or your kindness or gentleness or self-control? Have you been growing in your faithfulness in Christ? And you might be thinking, you know, honestly, I don't, I don't see any evidence or change or uh, I, don't, I don't see that type of growth in my life. I know more Bible verses. I spend more time in the church. I volunteer. I, I'm in multiple areas where I volunteer. You know, now I, I do that kind of stuff, but I don't see any of that type of growth in my heart. If you're thinking that, I, you, have to, you have to beware. You have to re-examine some things because that's evidence that you are not connected to the true vine. You may have religion on the outside, but you don't have a substance on the inside that is connecting you to an abiding relationship with Christ. I mean, it says he cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. It's the literal scripture. The second half of the verse is pretty surprising too. I don't know if you call this, but he says, so he says, if you aren't bearing fruit, you're cut off because it's not real. You're not having a real relationship with Christ. But then he says, but those who do bear fruit, they get pruned. Now, I don't know a lot about gardening. Some of you may be pretty surprised by that. But pruning is uh, it's when the gardener chops you up. You know, so that, that's, that's what it means to be pruned. It, it means to be cut. So think about it. False followers of Jesus, they get cut, right? Now, true followers of Jesus, they also get cut. As you notice, we're both getting cut there. Right? So this cut represents loss. And the second enemy that disconnects you from God is loss. Pruning represents something that you would lose. Now here's a question for you. Have you ever lost something or someone in your life and you've wondered why God allowed that to happen? Maybe you even lost your ability to focus because of anxiety, depression, or PTSD, or, or some other kind of mental uh, struggle that you've been having, and, and you've wondered why God allowed that to happen to you, or to your friend, or to your, your mother, or whoever it is. You start to ask God why he would allow something like that to happen to someone he cares for so much, and he loves so much. You start to question his love. You start to distance yourself from communion with him, and from having a connection with him. And in these moments, the enemy is trying to break your connection with God. You may, you may still be going to church, you're still singing the songs, you're still standing when the pastor says, stand and let's pray and take communion together, and, you know, you might, but, but now you have this barrier between you and God because of that event or that hurt or because of that mental breakdown that you had, and now you've lost your trust and faith with him, or you started to at least. The, this enemy, loss, this enemy will, will, will try to disrupt your connection with Jesus, and Jesus would say this to you right now. He would say, don't disconnect when you don't understand. Don't disconnect when you don't understand the pruning because the pruning is a process. Pruning is to reduce the size of the plant above the ground without reducing the size of the root system below the ground. So what happens when you prune a plant is that you limit what people can see so that what can't be seen can grow stronger and the inevitable result of pruning is that though the outside may look smaller, the inside actually grows bigger and it grows stronger so that the outside will later experience explosive growth. So you have this person on the outside that you can see, 
But then there's this person on the inside that you don't see, and God is saying he is about the growing of your inner person. He's about the growing of your faith. He's about the growing of your joy, your love, the growing of your life, the growing of your ability to stay focused, the, the, to stay connected to him in the easy and to cling to him through the difficult, to cling to, to him uh, through the anxiety and through the depression and through the suicidal thoughts, through the, the struggles that you're having. And sometimes God allows things to be taken away on the outside so that he can multiply the power of what's going on on the inside. Listen, I'm not saying what you would hear from most churches when, when they would say, when they're talking about this subject and they'd say, you know what, just pray, it'll be okay, just pray, it'll be okay. I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I'm saying understanding the process of pruning is important. Understanding that God is working on you from the inside, and to, uh, from the inside out, that, uh, part of that means you, you may need to seek help from others. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians that says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. And what I'm saying right now is the seed's been planted. I mean, you're sitting in this room, you're allowing us to talk to you about mental health, you're allowing people to surround you. The seed's been planted. But now you need to surround yourself with people that will water the seed. Surround yourself with people that will help you grow, that will encourage you, that will be there for you, that will listen and talk to you, that will come for you, that will guide you, that will give you some advice, that will take you to the right places. And if you're connected to God and abiding in Him, God will make you grow. You know, we will never understand why God allows certain things. Those things that seem like a big loss to us, we'll never fully understand it until we get to heaven and we get to ask God, what's that about? But we can understand that if we just stay connected to Him through the loss, God will stretch us and will prepare us for what's next. He will expand our joy. He'll expand our peace. He'll elevate your life. He will walk with you. He'll, be, he'll make you strong through the storms, and he'll, he'll be with you through the difficult if you trust him through the loss. So just stay connected. The third enemy, I can imagine, is one that probably every person in this room would admit to being familiar with. The third enemy is shame. Shame often comes in this very quiet voice that just whispers to you. It often comes as just a feeling but this enemy, this, this thing inside of you that, that tells you that you're not good enough, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's the thing that tells you uh, you're not accepted, you're not clean. It's that voice or that feeling that's, like, that's lingering in your head that's going, you know, I know what you did. I know what you keep doing. I know what you want to do. I know the sins you've committed. You think God hears your prayer. You think God is going to accept you. You think, you, you think you're clean. You're not clean. You're not accepted. You're not, you're not, you don't pray enough. You, you, you don't love people enough. You're not good enough. How do you expect God to really receive a person like you? That's the, that's the enemy of shame. Listen, church, I've got good news for you. And this news really ought to make you want to shout and get excited. In verse 3, God, Jesus gives you a, an answer already. He says that you have already been pruned and purified by the message that I have given you. See, this enemy tries to disconnect you with God. This feeling or these thoughts of shame, they're hard to shake, right? They linger and they linger. Have you ever been in a situation where, where you're, you sit there thinking, probably for no good reason, but you start thinking about five days ago or five weeks ago, five months ago, five years ago, you're thinking about something that you said or you did, a way you responded to someone, something, some decision you made, and you're sitting there thinking, man, how stupid was I to do that? And you're sitting there lingering on it for no reason. You start to think about your own worth and your own value in life, how you could have done something better, how, you, how now you have to prove yourself. And the entire time that you're thinking about these times, the, these different moments in your life, Jesus is saying, stop this kind of striving. You're already clean. You're already clean. You're, you're already clean. Why? Because of what you've done? No. Because of how good you've been? Not at all. Because of how you stopped that habit that you were, that, that's been dragging you down or because you, you know, you're trying to be the best person that you can be? Not at all. It's because of the word I have spoken to you. That's what Jesus says. The message that I have given to you. You know, there's a scripture in Hebrews 7 that says, the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice that Jesus made of himself was once and for all. So church, you could tell the shame that's going on inside of your head and inside of your heart right now. Get out once and for all because Jesus already paid the price. You know, you know who you are and you know whose you are. You know that God has a plan and a purpose for you. And that does not include feeling lonely, feeling anxious, feeling depressed, feeling suicidal, or anything other than alive and ready to shake up the world and be a light of Jesus everywhere you go. And I pray that you meditate on this one 
this week and remember that he forgave all of your sins and he's canceled the record of charges. He took that and he nailed it to the cross and it didn't come back with him whenever he rose from the dead. It stayed on that cross buried. So let's jump back to the scripture in in John 15 verses 4 and 5. It says, remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The fourth enemy that tries to break our connection with him is self-sufficiency. And I'll be the first to admit, oftentimes I have the mindset of, you know what, I'll just do it myself. I've been let down by so many people so many times in my life that it's hard for me to trust people, hard for me to rely on people. And so I have to remind myself, you know what, I'm going to trust them. I'm going to give them an opportunity. I have to remind myself that there are people that God has placed in my life and around me to help me, to strengthen me when I'm weak, to, to give me wisdom. And I'm also that guy for other people as well. But have you ever read the book of Job? Every time I read the book of Job, I'm like, man, this dude needs like the top-notch psychiatrist. He needs help. I, he needs a new mind, something. Uh, I don't know, some kind of weird exorcism or something. Job 38 verses 1 through 9, I'm going to read it to you real quick. It says, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man. Because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations on the earth? Tell me. If you know so much, who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations, and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy, who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb, and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness? Y'all, that's just half of it. Job is like, you know what? I'm self-sufficient. And God is like, I'm going to level with you, dude. You are not about to sit there complaining and thinking that you can do this all on your own. What I think that God is showing us in this is that self-sufficiency is nothing but a mirage. Self-sufficiency makes us rely on our own knowledge, our own thoughts. But Jesus is reminding us in John 15, verses 4 and 5, you may feel strong, you may feel competent, you may think that you're in control, but you're not. Apart from him, you can do nothing. And it's our jobs to confront this reality on our own. It's our jobs to confront the reality of our inability to produce on our own and to to learn to recognize that these four enemies, this forgetfulness and loss and shame and self-sufficiency, they are truly enemies to our health. And when, when we begin to see them in our lives, we need to remind ourselves that God has already determined and he's already ordered the steps, our steps, according to his purpose, according to his plan for us. And it's time for us to speak those truths over our own lives and to stay connected with him. God gives us our identity. The world doesn't. God is at work on the inside of us, even when you don't see it on the outside. Jesus already paid the price once and for all, for all of us. And staying connected to God will guide you through this hell on earth that we live in. Church, as we end every service here at ACC, I want you to ask this question to yourself. What now, God? And I want to read this real real quick to you, uh, verses 6 and 7. It says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. Listen, when you are dealing with issues that are wearing you out, issues that are in your lives that are exhausting, even making you sick physically, you know, stress, by the way, is one of the the main causes of most of the physical sicknesses that we deal with on a daily basis. It's important to remember that staying connected to God, remaining in Him, abiding in Him, that's, that's vital for our life. Because otherwise it says we're useless. It says it in that scripture. It says straight up in verse six, without our connection to God, we wither. We're no good to anyone or anything other than a bird pile. But if you if you remain in him and his words remain in you, you can ask anything you want and it will be granted. So do you want freedom from depression? You want freedom from anxiety? You want freedom from the struggles that you've been having, these habits that you have, these things that you chase after to replace 
uh, what you feel like is missing in your life, not realizing it's God, it's not things of this world. You want freedom from suicidal thoughts or, or from PTSD or whatever the struggle is. You want freedom. Stay connected to God. Stay connected to God. So how do we do that? The first thing is to stay connected to this, to his word, to the Bible. Romans 10, 17 says, by hearing, that is hearing the good news of Christ. And then you stay connected to the church. You know, one of the best ways that you can be, be reminded of what is in this word is to be in church. And then you get to surround yourselves with people that are other, other people that are here for the same reason, to, to learn, to be in the word, to, to grow spiritually, to grow in relationship with Christ, and they can do life with you. And then you get to do life with those people. You get to stay connected to other believers. Join a life group. I would encourage you to join a life group so that you have people to walk with you through every difficult situation and every storm. People that will consistently and constantly pray for you. They'll be able to bring you to the word and, and point out scriptures. They'll be able to, to speak hard truths to you. It's difficult to hear a hard truth from someone who you just see on a Sunday. But if you're doing life with them, they could speak something into you that, would, that could change your life forever. So go ahead and stand to your feet, church. As the worship team gets ready to, to, to lead us in one more song, I want to pray over you. Oh, there goes all of those. Father, we, we love you so much. God, we are so grateful that we get to, to lead on you and rely on you. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would be so connected to you. Father, I pray, Lord, that every single person in here would connect to you as the true vine that would that, that would recognize the things that are in our lives that we have connected to us that we have connected as, as a replacement of you father that I pray Lord that we would be able to see those false vines in our lives that we would be able to cut them out father God I pray Lord that as you as you are, are cutting away father that you're not cutting away because we're false followers father I pray Lord that you'd be pruning us so that we can go deeper in our relationship with you because without you father there's no such thing as a healthy mind without you father we would never be able to chase being healthy and, and mentally and from a mental health perspective God I pray Lord that that we would be able to stay connected with you and that we'd be able to be uh, that, that you would put people in our in our position, our people around us, Father, to, to pray with us, to be surrounding us, to be strong with us uh, whenever we are feeling weak, Father. God, I pray, Lord, that you would be with us, that you, your presence would surround us. And as we worship you, God, I pray, Lord, that you would receive it as a sweet fragrance to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.